subconscious contracts, we can often find them most easily when we think about confusing self-sabotaging behaviors. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two, one. It's time for Life Interrupted Radio, a show dedicated to practical skills for your mind, body, and soul. We're hoping we'll go in one ear and stay there. Here's the host of the show, Sharon Saylor. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. The NIH estimates nearly 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder. To put that in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. You'll be as surprised as I was to find out what autoimmune entails. I brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. So let's get started. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And today I'm doing a pre-record and I have to tattle on myself a little bit here. <laughs> I got so into having our guests on, I forgot to hit record a few minutes ago. <laughs> so, I, so I'm apologizing to my guest here, but uh, she knows that she just has this way that I get mesmerized with everything she says. So I'm not going to talk about my weekend coming up or anything like that, guys. I'm going to jump right in because I want to have every second that I can with Sarah Payton. She's been our guest before, and she is awesome. Some of the highest rated shows I have, The Art of Compassion and several others she's done, are absolutely some of the highest rated shows that I have. And you'll find out in just a couple of minutes why. Sarah Payton is an international speaker, internationally best-selling author and facilitator, and she has a passion for weaving together neuroscience knowledge and experiences of healing that unify people with their brains and bodies. I know that sounds really big and heavy, right? (laughs) But Sarah has this marvelous way of breaking down things like interpersonal neurobiology, all these sciences, and making it to where we can understand it, (laughs) the people without. I like to think of her as this marvelous translator, you know, for us out here and those people doing all the research. Sarah has this way of understanding the research and breaking it down to, oh, I get it, Sarah. Thank you. So without further ado, and I got to applaud her on her best-selling book. It's her first book, Your Resident Self, had international best-selling status. And I finally captured her. She's traveling all around the world these days. I finally captured her for a little bit. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Sharon. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for understanding that I got so excited. I forgot to hit record for the first couple of minutes there. I'm so excited, too. <laughs> So one of the things that we wanted to talk about, and this was a couple of months ago, so I'm going to read it because I think it's a fabulous title, but I get too excited around Sarah. I just love everything she says. We're going to talk about unconscious contracts and sacred vows, how we limit our life energy. And I'll tell you, I really bumped into this this morning, Sarah, on so many levels. So I'm really excited to know about it. But first, just I want everybody to know about your book. We're going to talk at the end about your book, too. But congratulations on your resident self. What a mega hit out of the gate. Oh, thank you so much. For people who are interested in the book, there's a book website, yourresonantself.com, that has guided meditations that can really support immune system strengthening and and resilience. So um, learning to be kind to ourselves is a step-by-step action. It's a step that can be a step-by-step action plan. We have very good reasons for not being kind to ourselves. And so as we become more and more aware of those very good reasons, then we can start to kind of turn towards ourselves with a warmth and resonance and accompaniment that we never could have dreamed was even possible. No, absolutely. Some, so many of the things I've learned from Sarah, I repeat constantly on the show. And she's the marvelous one that taught me the two things that we're always asking ourselves, and that's, am I safe? And once we come to terms with that, the second one we want to know is, do I matter? And that changed the way I looked at so much of things, Sarah. That was profound for me. And one other thing that you talk about, though, that's profound for me was how we squeeze ourselves down, pinch ourselves down to fit into tiny little places 
that somehow we get this idea that's where we're supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. We, we make ourselves smaller than we would naturally be in order to fit in with what's welcome with the people that we're with. And especially we carry sort of an imprint of what was welcome in our original caregiving relationship with our mother or whoever our primary caregiver was. So we will be talking about this today, about how, exactly the mechanics of how this happens and some steps to take to invite ourselves into a different relationship uh, with our own life energy, which can be so important if we're struggling with health in any way at all. That's one of the things that I've come to understand at a deeper level through my four-year journey of recovery from the autoimmune. I guess I thought, I'm not sure what I thought energy was before that, but just learning about life energy and how you can actually feel it running through your system or not, and understanding when I'm clamping myself down and doing some mindfulness work to change the flow of it. Mm -hmm. That's when it became so profound. It was like, wow, I really have control over this. Yeah, and we'll, t we'll talk today about the way in which we have made an unconscious agreements with ourselves that stop us from having control. But then we can release these unconscious agreements by making them conscious and asking ourselves if we really want them. And then new choices become available. Well, let's jump right in. I'm, I'm excited to hear this. <laughs> We're going to be thinking very deeply today about the research of a woman named Beatrice Beebe, who has been doing close video study of mothers and four-month-old infants in New York City for the last three or four decades. This woman is my hero. So what she does is she takes a mom and a baby. So if you and I were the mom and the baby, then she'd have a video camera behind your head and a video camera behind my head looking mm -hmm. at each other's faces, very high-definition videos filming. And then she takes those videos and shows them side by side, microsecond by microsecond, so that you can see how the mom's facial expression responds to the baby's facial expression. And what happens is that what we see when we're looking at this level of microsecond by microsecond is we see how, what an incredible dance of interrelationship and emotional reflection a mom and a baby are. What happens for babies is babies are born with all the facial expressions. Sort of like, you know how babies are born being able to make every sound that's in any human language. So the baby's born and has all the facial expressions. So the baby's sad and the sad baby makes a sad facial expression and the baby is scared and the baby makes a scared facial expression and the baby is angry and the baby makes an angry facial expression. And if the mama has been well supported in her own childhood and is not under too much stress and is not suffering from postnatal depression, then her face will naturally reflect all the facial expressions that the baby makes. Just for a microsecond, before she, like a baby's angry, and before she goes to fix it and take care of the baby and help the baby stop fussing, her face goes, of course you're angry. She may not even say the words, of course you're angry, but her facial expression is letting the baby know that their experience, their emotional experience has been caught, that it, like, it creates a completion circuit for the baby. And the emotions come through the baby, and the baby's mama's reflection of those emotions, the baby goes, oh, I make sense. My emotional experience makes sense. Ah, yes, of course I'm angry. Yes, of course I'm sad. Yes, of course I'm frightened. And inside of the baby's right hemisphere, we have a left hemisphere, and we have a right hemisphere. And inside the baby's right hemisphere, there are new fibers being formed. Babies are just working on getting that right hemisphere in order for about the first, for pretty much the first three years. There's so much focus here in terms of brain development. The left hemisphere starts coming online with words. So it starts to, you know, 18 months, the baby starts to say single words, and then there's more building of sentences and so on, and then complex thought. It's all happening there in the left hemisphere with the words. But the right hemisphere is being structured for our long-term health, and resilience for the rest of our lives in these early experiences of whether or not our mom's face is responsive to our face. Imagine wow. something. Now, a couple of questions come to mind. 
if we didn't have that experience, is it teachable? I mean, it's not all over if we miss that experience. Happily, the fibers that are being formed in the right hemisphere are the most neuroplastic and growth-happy fibers of our human brain. They continue. So if this were our, our emotional center of our brain, it's got a different structure in there, in the middle of our brain, deep inside in there. What happens is that every time the, the baby's getting the message, oh, I make sense, this baby's brain is growing fibers from mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex to hold and nestle their emotional self. They're like going, yeah, well, of course I'm sad. And by the time the baby's 18 months old, we can actually see this. Uh, when the baby's separated from the mother, they still think they make sense. <laughs> They're still experiencing like, oh, I am a coherent being in the world. And they carry their internalized mother with them. They're starting already at 18 months to carry the internalized mother with them. So let's get more specific here. So if a baby's sad, then the mom's face makes a sad face. If the mom has had the experience that her sadness has never been held, then her face can't make a sad face in response to the baby's face. She doesn't know how. Literally, she's never been held in her sadness herself. So her face doesn't do that microsecond expression reflection with the baby, which means that by the time the baby's four months old, the baby stops making sad faces. Wow. Yeah. Or if the mom can't do anger, no anger. There's no anger response. The mom's face is blank or she does a happy face instead. The baby stops making the angry face. This is how we write off entire swaths of emotional experience by the time that we are four months old. Before we even have words, we are writing off entire swaths of emotional experience in order to belong to the culture of our mother or to the culture of our father if he's the primary caregiver, whoever's the primary caregiver. We're modifying ourselves. We're letting go of entire swaths of life energy in the form of emotions in order to be in relationship with our mamas. Now, I love that. And it's fantastic we know that. But honestly, right now I'm a little depressed because I'm like, okay, I'm way beyond four months old. Mm. Um, I can. How do we uncover this or how do we rectify it if some of that makes complete sense of why I behave the way I have? Because maybe, you know, I know families where anger is never allowed or I know families where laughter is never allowed. And can we mom ourselves at some point? We can mom ourselves so sweetly. And we can, as we begin to notice what are the swaths of life energy that we've cut off, we haven't talked about happiness yet. It's very interesting with happiness. I'm going, to I'm going to talk about how we change things, but first I'll talk about happiness and how we cut off happiness. Okay. So we've talked about anger, fear, sadness. One of the interesting things about happiness is that happiness makes us big. It, 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 babies make noise when they're happy. There, there's, wow. a, you know, there's an energy you know, that's happening when babies are laughing. And if a mom is securely attached, what she does is she goes a little bit bigger than the baby. Just a little bit. You can see it in the micro, in these microsecond videos, that the mom's smile is a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, a little bit more liveliness in the face. Not a lot, but a little bit more so that the baby knows that there's a room for more happiness. If the mom has never been held in her happiness, what she does is she diminishes the baby's happiness. Instead of going a little bit bigger, she does it. Mm. She oh my makes, gosh. Yes, yeah, she makes a diminished happiness response. And here's a primary place where people are learning to diminish their life energy so that they will fit with what's welcome for their mama. So by the age of four months, they're learning exactly how much happiness they can express and still be in relationship with their mom. As humans, we're sort of designed to have a shame response when we go outside the emotional holding that our mother is capable of or our peer group is capable of or our classroom, any group that we're in, our workplace, whatever it is, there's a culture of emotional expression. It's, for example, it's okay to be sad. It's not okay to be angry. It's okay to be angry. It's never okay to be afraid. 
we have these cultural sort of paradigms that we start to work in as soon as we leave that original dyad with the mom. And when we go outside the emotional expression that's allowed by our group, then we'll actually have a shame response. And this is why people will say, I'm too much. Like this is one of those limiting beliefs that go, I'm, I'm too much, I'm too big, I'm too noisy, I'm too emotional. It's because the window that they're trying to fit into is much smaller than what their natural expression is. But this also is a place where we pinch ourselves down to be small enough to fit in with whoever it is that we're fitting in with. The largest stamp that we carry when we're thinking about emotional limitation is that primary original experience of the relationship with whoever the primary caregiver was. A quick question, and then we'll need to jump into a quick commercial break, but a quick question on that is, if we are in a different group, different culture, and we're not quite sure of what's allowed, do we sort of like refer back to that culture from our mom and go, okay, I'm going to start here as my place? And Yeah. And because I'm thinking about when you said, I'm too much. I've met people like that that are just big and gregarious and funny and, you know, and, and bold. And, and then I can see them shift depending on the culture. So do we use that as a reference and then move through Absolutely. the world and trying to figure out, okay, how much more or less can I do here? And we often will carry the prohibition with us, even though the culture that we're in has more room for us to be emotionally expressive, we'll carry that original prohibition with us and believe that we need to be smaller than we actually do to belong. Oh, and wow. when we come back from our commercial break, we will talk about it. And the unconscious contract, how to find it, how to work with it, and how to begin to experience it. Oh, more, more that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that great segue, Sarah, because you could just see on my face if you're watching on the video, I was ready to jump into the next question. So we'll be right back <laughs> with Sarah Payton. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour, but maybe you didn't know I'm also an author, mostly nonfiction, but recently I delved into the world of children's fiction with the Pinky Chenille series. If you haven't had a chance to check out Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, go over and check it out at PinkyChenille.com. That's Pinky, P-I-N-K-Y, Chenille, C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E, Dot com. Thanks. See you there. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. I am Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family and then boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee, and they resettle you to America, and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. Tonight, we're here with Sarah Payton. She's an international speaker, an international best-selling author and facilitator who just has this 
beautiful uncanny knack of how to blend neuroscience knowledge and experiences into healing to unify our brain and our body and I want to say our life energy and just unify the whole thing. And before we had to take that quick commercial break, Sarah was sharing with us the studies out there now about how so much of how we go about life is already developed by four months old, which was shocking to me that that little time can play such a huge role in our lives. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, Sarah, this concept of unconscious contracts. Mm -hmm. So what are those and how do we get into them and how do we get out rewrite them? them? <laughs> <laughs> Our unconscious contracts, we can often find them most easily when we think about confusing self-sabotaging behaviors. Like if we never finish anything or if we never start anything, or if we always believe that we are too much, or if we always believe that we are too little. One of the ways to find them is to prompt the brain by using language, which is, of course, I'm always like, how do we use language to hack the brain? So one of the ways we can use language in, in respect to these pre-verbal, deeply unconscious prohibitions against ourselves existing is to, first of all, name the behavior that we notice. Like I, I've been working with, uh, with never, never showing my sadness, which is obviously a, one of those deep, deep uh, unconscious contracts. I only remember seeing my mother cry once in her whole life. And I think that even when she was crying, her face wasn't making a sad face. And I remember that when I came out of my childhood, I couldn't interpret sadness. I, there's this wonderful man named Paul Ekman. You can buy these video things where you practice facial expressions and you practice recognizing them. And when I was first trying to recognize facial expressions, I couldn't get grief. I would always think it was surprise or fear. That it was sadness. It didn't register for me. It took me about eight months. I worked with the with this computer program because I was so I was so intrigued by my own incapacity. And I was working with this video program and at about eight months I started getting the, the grief and I was like, oh it's sadness. Oh this is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> And then I would be working with clients and they would make a grief face, which is, I don't know if I can do it right now because I'm sort of happy talking to you, but it's where the uh, eyebrows come up and together and you see these deep lines, you'll see these deep lines in people's foreheads that are grief lines. And I, after I, you know, worked with this video program, I would look at my clients and go, oh, there's a grief face. And I would say, are you sad? And they would go, yes, I'm very sad. <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, I understood it. I'm so surprised that this was an entire swath of emotional experience that just wasn't that available to me before, before I started to learn the way in which I had been unconsciously limited. Quick question, though, yeah. before we could dive into that. You have so much background and training and all. Did you come to that realization at first about the sadness on your own? Or did you sort of hear people say something about you like, didn't no. you see I was sad or no. I mean, was that no. outsourced? I learned to speak it so well, you know, and I think we can, people will say, and I'm sad. And then you can reflect that, you know, oh, you're sad. And, you know, I mean, it's, you don't notice what you don't know. You don't notice the ways that you've turned off experience. That's what I was curious. Cause I was thinking about a couple of my friends where uh, I've just occasionally said something, or I have always thought that they sort of missed a mark somewhere. And I'm thinking, how many times do other people no say something about, maybe un not say it out loud, but internally they have this, like, wow, she kind of missed the mark on that. I'm wondering if having those close trusted friends or be able to have the permission to tell you yeah, that would, would be, be helpful in that growth of, because like you said, what you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I discovered it in this sort of funny roundabout way where nobody was actually giving me that feedback, but it would be fun to, you know, uh, to be able to have close friends and have a shared understanding of this incredible nonverbal prohibition that we can carry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So then, I, and then after I did this, that was when I discovered Beatrice Peavy. And I was like, oh, my mother's face was never sad. 
oh, I was, this was never reflected for me. No wonder. And of course, her sadness was never reflected when she was a little one. It's not, you know, it's not deliberate that our parents carry their trauma with them. They carry their trauma with them because that's what happened to them when they were little. So you can have entire family lines that don't carry anger, right? Or mm -hmm. don't show grief. And people won't notice. They really honestly won't, won't notice because it's so deeply unconscious. But if we do start to notice, like I'm starting to notice now, right? With this sense of, I cannot let people see me cry. That's just not okay. It's too much for me. It's too much for them. I can't survive it. It's not survivable. So my unconscious contract then would be something like, I, Sarah Payton, solemnly swear. And then you have the two. Who do you swear to? Well, mostly you're swearing to yourself. You can have these whole situations where you're swearing to your mother. But in this case, I'm pretty sure I'm swearing to myself. So I, Sarah, solemnly swear to my essential self that I will not let anybody see the depth of my grief. The depth of my grief or the that I am sad at all. I will not let anyone see me cry. I will not let anyone see. It's almost like the bottomless nature of my grief. Mm. And then the question, the next question, and this is where the language is a, is a hack that lets you see what is the deep need that you're meeting with this unconscious contract. So the deep need that I'd be meeting, I, Sarah, solemnly swear to my essential self that I will not show anyone the depth of my grief in order to, and you, you, you kind of feel it, you can feel it fluttering in your body, the truth, whatever the truth is. It's not a truth that you've known before. So if it's something that's very simple, because my mother didn't, couldn't bear it, that's, that's not a truth enough. It has to, you have to find that truth in your body and it comes out in the words. So I, in order to, I will not show anyone the depth of my grief in order to, it's something like, uh, not know it myself because it is not survivable. Wow. Yeah. And then the final part of the contract is no matter the cost to myself. Hmm. Yeah. And that's where in the unconscious contract, we can get into that point where we start taking it out on the physical body mm -hmm. and, and things start manifesting. Yes, I will not show grief, no matter the cost to myself. Yes, there's a cost. Exactly. There's a cost to our health. There's a cost to our well-being. There's a cost to our relationships. There's a cost to the depth and intimacy of our relationships. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this just takes us so many places. I'm going to cut for a quick commercial break so I can regroup here, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. That was so profound. Mm -hmm life-altering. I, I so appreciate your vulnerability and your authenticity when you come on the show. I get so many amazing insights during this time. But I'm going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, right back, we'll continue on with Sarah about this topic, because I know you can hear it too, how this can change the game. This does change the game. So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Do you want to be a better leader? Have better relationships? Become more self-aware? Be a better communicator? Hi, I'm Sharon Saylor, best-selling author, professional speaker, and executive coach. And my life passion is empowering professionals to be the best that they can be. After years of working with professionals, I've discovered the seven things nobody is telling you that can cost you your clients, sales, and even your career. And I want to give it to you free. You've heard my show. You know my passion. And maybe we'll be working together sooner rather than later. So go grab this ebook now to find out the seven things that's costing you big time over at SharonSailor.com forward slash radio gift. The best of holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site. 
but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. What are all the things you witness online in a day? Cats playing piano, selfies on your feed, your friend's picture being turned into a nasty meme that's been shared 50 times, 51, 52. When someone's being bullied online, it's hard to know what to do. Now you can speak up with the witness emoji. It looks like an eye in a speech bubble, and it's in the symbol section near the clocks in your phone. You'll let the world know it isn't cool, and you'll let your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and we've been talking to tonight with Sarah Payton. She's the international speaker and international best-selling author of Your Resident Self. She's also a facilitator, and she has this awesome expertise and ability to take neuroscience knowledge and experiences emotion, all of these things that sort of mystify us, <laughs> goes and she learns from the best scientists in the world. And she has this beautiful ability to synthesize it and make it translate it for mm-hmm. us. And that's what I love because Sarah to me is this beautiful translator. I see that sometimes I read the same or similar uh, papers that she reads, <laughs> and uh, I sort of glaze over, and she's able to translate it almost as if it's a, well, it is a foreign language. So I so honor that. That's one of many Sarah's amazing skills. And tonight we've been talking about these unconscious contracts and sacred vows we make to ourselves and how we limit our life energy. And Sarah was just uh, sharing with us a very real and authentic vulnerability in how these contracts can be so deep Mm -hmm. and in one way so hidden i did it take you a while to get to that point i mean it that seems so profound yeah that once we start to understand the technology of sort of deconstructing the unconscious contract we'll find all kinds of them in many different places and many different ways i remember that i i first discovered them because i was working with the tendency i had to shut down my life energy if I was working with women who are older than myself. And I was like, what is going on? Why do I make myself small instead of claiming my full power and energy if I'm co-teaching with somebody who's my senior? And so I started working with this sacred vow contract kind of format that we were looking at before the break. And what I discovered was that I had a vow to not sort of not to breathe in order for my mother to have oxygen in a world that did not have enough oxygen. Wow, that is quite an intense vow. In the case where I was working with that one, it felt like I was making the promise to my mother. My mother long dead, but it felt like I was making the promise to my mother. And so I actually said the vow aloud, and then I thought, hmm, I wonder what my mother would have to say about this. (laughs) So I imagine myself stepping into my mother and saying, Mother, Sarah's mother, did you hear this vow that Sarah made to you not to breathe so that you, you would have enough oxygen in a world that did not have enough oxygen? She says, and I remember <laughs> as her, I was standing there, I go, well, that's a silly vow. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I want for you. I don't want you not to breathe. My lack of oxygen in this world is my responsibility. It was my life, and it was not your responsibility. I release you from this vow, Sarah, and I revoke this contract. That's what spontaneously came out of me in this moment when I was discovering this kind of process. And, and I stepped back into myself, and I felt much lighter. 
often when you do this work, you feel like a lightness. It's kind of, ah, you can breathe more easily. You're not carrying the same heaviness. And this is another place, do you see, where the life energy was compressed and pinched. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to take up more space than my mom. I wanted her to have, you know, these vows are based on such deep love for our parents. We want them to have the best. So we want to stay small enough that they can love us easily, right? Or we want to not take up the oxygen. I mean, so often it's a vow deeply based on love. So then I went on and I started, you know, experimenting with this. Well, if you've got a self-sabotaging behavior, what is the deep need that it's meeting? How is this a vow of love? And how is it a vow of love for this self? So before the break, we were looking at my vow about sadness, not to reveal sadness. In this moment, it feels like in order to, to save myself from utter obliteration and disappearance, like entering the void somehow. Wow. And so then I would step in. The next step is you, whoever you've made the vow to, it's easiest really to have it be to yourself. Mothers are a little more tricky to work with. You can work <laughs> with them, but they are trickier. <laughs> okay. So, if, so as Sarah's essential self, do I want this for Sarah? It's so lonely for her if she doesn't let anybody know how sad she is. So then the next question is, is the sadness obliterative? Will it actually destroy me? And I think the answer is no for my essential self. The answer is no, Sarah, the sadness will not destroy you. And your mother has gone. She's no longer on this earth with her incapacity to make sad faces. And so I say to myself, Sarah, I release you from this vow and I revoke this contract. I want you to be able to be sad and happy and angry and afraid. And to be able to let the people around you know what's happening. And I feel this sort of like stepping on the edge of a precipice, like this kind of heart tension of like, oh, what will happen next? Is the world going to explode? And that's a common thing that happens with people as they release these vows, because we're stepping into the unknown when we release the vows. We're not stepping into a familiar world. If the world is no longer as circumscribed as our vow convinced us that it was, then something very different is possible. And so then we can say, Sarah's heart, do you need acknowledgement of unfamiliarity? Are you not quite sure how to beat in a world where sadness might actually be welcome? Yes, I say, and take a deep breath. So here's a little, this is, a, this is giving your, you and your listeners a bit of a sense of the way that we can begin to work even with these deeply formed pre-verbal understandings of what's okay and what's not okay. How are you doing? Oh. Uh, I'm profound. I, I'm mesmerized, profound, uh, moved, like always, my dear. This is so fascinating to me. And as you're doing it, I'm having my own experience mm. in a different language, different uh, thoughts pop in because we're from different places. But this, the language that is used is at such an elemental level. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's at this very raw elemental level that finding these things, they're almost spontaneously appearing without, yeah. which, yeah. I think in other situations, I'm not sure I would have been able to find them uh, with the same spontaneity or, and authenticity. Uh, with this particular language that I'm hearing and taking my sort of side journey uh, is that it's, it's such an acknowledging language that it does, it's, the way you always language things, it makes it so safe just for those things to appear. Mm. and where you know i'm not sure where they're appearing from it sometimes but um yeah oh my gosh i'm mesmerized here oh my god so as we do this and you, as you mentioned there are multiple multiple of these contracts that will begin to uncover as we start this process with ourselves and as we go through this is there 
a point, well, I guess my question is, we just continue to unfold and say, I learned to limit myself this way here, or I learned to limit myself that way there. How do we begin to, as we develop this in ourselves, continue to integrate it? Or do we go through this process each time? Or I guess my question is, it sometimes appears spontaneously where like, oh, <laughs> It does. As we There's do. this contract. Yeah. Do I really want this contract? No, Sarah, I release you from this contract. I revoke this vow. Yeah. Um, we become more used to it, I think. This is, for your listeners and for you, this is not in the book. This is book two. This is the book I'm currently... Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I love that <laughs> with some of this stuff in your resident self, Sarah and I, Sarah was profoundly uh, mesmerizing me with and some of the, for your resident self before too. This is so exciting. I love that. I love that. And this, you could tell you have to get your resident self guys. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more in just a few minutes, but let's talk a little bit more about other ways that we limit ourselves. So we've discovered that we have unconscious contracts and these sacred vows. And to me, I was seeing the the depth that these can go, how profound they can be. Yeah. And not just shifting my own insight, but how it could shift, I'll say like with the mother aspect of it, a relationship between someone and, the, and a parent or a relationship yeah you know, any sort of strained relationship, when you get to that point of where you like uncover the vow, you know, I could see how it could change the outside relationship too, not just the relationship with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You get a new sense of empathy for the other. Yeah. yeah. If there was another person involved in the contract. It's so interesting. I was, I got to have the opportunity to do this work specifically in relationship with people's negative messages towards themselves and the one that people so often don't want to say can be so profound they that they'll have a, a negative message that says i should not be alive wow. and I, yeah i got to work with somebody who was in their 70s a man who was in his 70s and he said i have this negative message i have had it since i was small every day every minute of my life I have this negative message that says, I should not be alive, I should not be alive, I should not be alive. And I said, okay, let's look at this from the standpoint of the vow work. I, Charles, solemnly swear to my essential self that I will always believe that I should not be alive. In order to, and then we waited you know, just as we waited with me to see what would come, what comes from him. Why has he made an agreement with himself to believe that he should not be alive? And he said, ah, it's because my mo- it was a bur- I was a burden for my mother. Mm. She, she already had six children. And I was the seventh child and I was just an added burden. And then I said, okay, so it's, I will always believe that I should not be alive in order to honor my mother's life and the level of burden that she was living under. And he says, yes, I I think that's it. And so then he said it. And I said, no, no matter the cost to myself, he said, no matter the cost to myself. And he was like, and I said, okay, let's find out from your essential self if this is a vow that you want to keep. And he stepped into being his own essential self. And he said, oh, this is a very harsh and painful and punishing vow to keep just to honor my mother. I can honor my mother and I can love her and honor her burden. She's long dead. I can honor her burden even without this vow. Charles, I release you from this vow and I revoke this contract. And he said said he could feel the weight just kind of like, you know, those movies where stuff is kind of disseminating, you know, just dissolving out of someone. And he walked out and he was, he, he said, I can't believe it. I don't have that message. I don't have the message. I've been carrying it for 70 years every day, every minute. So do you see how even the most difficult and scary messages are so often based on a deep, deep love? 
And as we begin to see that, it, it loosens and changes. And, and so many things change for people when they start to think about kind of the love that lies at the heart of the pain. Wow. The love that lies at the heart of the pain. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Here I am out of breath. I got to take a drink of tea. I, I'm just... Mm. That is so profound. So we'll be right back. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour, but maybe you didn't know I'm also an author, mostly nonfiction, but recently I delved into the world of children's fiction with the Pinky Chenille series. If you haven't had a chance to check out Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, go over and check it out at PinkyChenille.com. That's Pinky, P-I-N-K-Y, Chenille, C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E, Dot com. Thanks. See you there. Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Om Times Experts Program. With Om Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Hey, Dr. Phil here. You know, I help people solve difficult problems every day, but one problem has me stumped, childhood hunger. Nearly 16 million children in America struggle with it. Luckily, the Feeding America network of local food banks collects surplus food, giving hope to hungry children and their families. But they need your help. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio. I'm your host, Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and we've been talking tonight with Sarah Payton. I don't have another question, dear. Um, <laughs> where should, I am just bathing in this whole concept, and I call it bathing. I'm feeling it throughout my entire body. It's vibrating at a different yeah. vibration right now with yeah. the whole concept. It takes us deeply into our souls, I think. Yeah. And I could see where those sorts of self-talk, and in, in the case of Charles, for 70 years how the body the physical body yes could begin to integrate that thought yes exactly yeah i shouldn't breathe i shouldn't take up space i shouldn't exist i shouldn't uh be a burden i shouldn't express my sorrow yeah it, it directly impacts our being wow now as we go through the process is there a time that as you're releasing the vow i'm curious if it ever comes up similar but not the same i've told the story before on air where years ago i have a beautiful friend who's also my massage therapist so she knows my body well Mm. 
and she's been my friend for almost 40 years now. Oh, years ago, I kept going in for shoulder pain. And she kept, finally, these are the kinds of friends you love, like you and I, and she and I are. She said, well, if you take the knife out of your back, you'd be fine. <laughs> now, what was interesting to me, it was sort of a different route. Mm -hmm. But I got to a similar place when like, like, okay, why do I have a knife in my back? Okay, well, let's walk, take, you know, went through a process of removing the knife. But it then took me through, I didn't know it was, a, I didn't know the language at the time, but I had a contract yeah. on why I would carry the knife. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious, once I released that, the, pain, the shoulder pain has never come back. Oh, that's marvelous. It gives me goosebumps. Do you find that sometimes people can give words like, oh, well, it, he, she, they are a pain in the rear, and then they go through your process, and all of a sudden their rear gets better? Or oh, absolutely. I was working recently with uh, someone in Europe who had shoulder pain. And this is not a contract, but rather a trauma bubble. So, so you know, a similar kind of thing. But I was doing empathy for the shoulder, the cells of the shoulder. And we've done this a little bit before on this show where we say, cells of Lucille's shoulder, are you, are you holding very tightly in order to keep Lucille safe? You know? And there was some release, but not a lot of release. And finally I said to this woman, I wonder if you've ever been shaken, if you've ever been, if your shoulder has ever been shaken. And she said, uh, I was choked. She wow. said, I, I had a, I had a, one of my first partners, there was domestic violence, and he tried to choke me. And we did, you know, the time travel empathy that we've done before and on this, on this program. Stepping through time and space, acknowledge, freezing, freezing the event, taking away the perpetrator, and then, you know, acknowledging what needed to be acknowledged for her and bringing her former self back through time to present time. And then the shoulder pain was gone. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, our time is almost Ooh. come down. <laughs> when we get together, um, my community loves you as much as I love you. I mean, we hang on every word. And as I say, your shows are some of the most listened to consistently. And Sarah hasn't been on the show for a while because she's been so busy promoting her beautiful book. It just took off right out of the gate, which was so thrilling for me to see because I knew it, it was there. And I'm so thrilled that the world is finding that Sarah is there too. So please share with us more about how to get the book and uh, how people can find you because oh, thank you. you're awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Sharon. The book website is yourresonantself.com. No spaces. And then that website will also take you to my other website that shows my offerings online. And you can begin to learn this resonant language on a fully online course that you do on your own time. And then there's uh, different kinds of online courses and in-person courses. And, and uh, the book, I think I said, the book website has the free downloads of the guided meditations that take you through step-by-step -step away to begin to deeply understand why you would not be compassionate towards yourself, which is one of the things we've been touching on today, and also a step-by-step -step guide on how to begin to be kind to yourself. And that's yourresonantself.com, as well as, is it The Empathy Brain or just Empathy Brain? Brain com. And it's a great book. I'm a fan of the paper book. I mean, you know, because I, I love to write notes and take notes in a book. But the Kindle books is beautifully done as well. <laughs> that just shows I'm just a book person. I just love yeah. the paper parts of books. Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show again. This was just awesome. I just know the transformation for people is huge, again, as all your other visits have been. Thank you for taking the time. All the best for this book and your forthcoming book as well and your international travels I know you're headed out on soon so bless you bless you for being such a supporter of the autoimmune hour and bless you for being my friend it's oh, just awesome. such a pleasure everyone go have a great weekend whatever your adventures be sure and join me here next Friday night 7 p.m. for another episode of the autoimmune hour if you haven't had a chance yet 
pop over to lifeinterruptedradio.com and sign up for Transcribe Tribe. Right there we have all the transcripts that you can go. So if you wanted to look at the language that Sarah used today, it will be there in transcript form as well as you'll be able to see the video up on our YouTube channel, which is Life Interrupted Radio over on YouTube. That's brand new that we're working on. And our latest foray is into Instagram. So I'm almost out of time, but I'll share more with you next week about our jump into Instagram. (laughs) We're trying to bring the show to you as many ways as possible. Have a great weekend. And as always, enjoy. The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. You've been listening to Life Interrupted Radio. To learn more, listen to other shows, and gain free resources that can help empower your life, be sure to stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com. This episode is brought to you by mindfulnessinactionbook.com. To get your free four-minute guided meditation to relax, refresh, and renew in just four minutes, and who doesn't have four minutes? Stop by MindfulnessInActionBook.com now. This guided meditation is in handy MP3 format, so you can use it anywhere, anytime. Download it now at MindfulnessInActionBook.com. This is the EWN Radio Network.